Welcome back to Mark on Motoring, where today I'm at Castle Howard for their annual classic car show. Now, I actually visited here um, just as a spectator about four years ago, um, and I remember it was quite a huge show even back then, so uh, obviously I really want to come myself and uh, exhibit here. There's going to be a lot to see today. Now, I'm actually parked in the uh, 90s row, so they've uh, divided it up by era, and then you've got some owners' clubs scattered about as well. And I'm quite happy with uh, what I've seen so far. I mean, I'm actually next to this lovely white um, Escort Cosworth, uh, we've got an Astra GTE, a Nova, um, going up the other way, Porsche, Ford Probe. I've got quite a, a selection of cars here. Um, and as I say, a lot of uh, cars from earlier decades as well. So um, we'll go around and have a look and uh, see what we can find. So one car that caught my eye immediately this morning was this NSU owned by Malcolm here. Now, the NSU is uh, quite a rare and unique car. It um, has a rotary engine. Now, rotary engines we really know uh, from being in some Mazdas, but really not seen in any other cars at all. So, Malcolm, how, how did you come to own an NSU? Yeah, well, I saw one when I was quite young, and I thought it was quite futuristic, so I decided I'll have one of those when I get a bit older, you know. Yeah. And I looked at them in the uh, early 80s, and they were fitting Ford V4 engines in them, but I, I definitely wanted one, but I couldn't afford it, could I? Because the kids arrived and whatever, so I waited until late 90s, and I actually got this one in 1996. Right. And then proceeded to strip it. I didn't. I didn't even drive it. I stripped it down completely. Yeah. And rebuilt it uh, over a period of years. In 2014, uh, I got it back on the road in 2014. Yeah. And uh, you know, a few bits and pieces to do on it, and yeah. it now runs runs really well. Yeah. And how do you find the the overall driving experience oh, then? It's really good. Like I mean, it's lovely and comfortable car to drive. Like mm. uh, the seats are really good. Uh, the only the only problem is the, the fuel consumption, which is only 18 miles per gallon. Yeah, rotary engines are always known for being uh, a little bit on the uh, thirsty side. Yeah, all like that, aren't they? Yeah, with fuel and oil. Um, well, but they're, they're meant to use oil, to yeah. be fair. That's part of the process to lubricate the uh, inside of the housings. Yeah. Uh, but you've just got to keep an eye on the oil levels, you know? Yeah. Now, rotary engines are typically a smaller capacity as well, aren't they, than, yeah, well, um, than a, a conventional piston yeah, engine? This one's supposedly 995cc, but it's normally uh, taxed as a, as a 2 litre. Right. Um, and what sort of power does that put out? That's 112 brake horsepower. Yeah. Which certainly for a car of the sort of 1970s, 60s, oh, yeah, 60s, 60s yeah. First out, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for, for an engine of that size of that time, oh. I know today we live in a world of turbocharged one litre oh, engines yeah, that, yeah. that can produce that, but for, for that time I mean, that would have, I mean, yeah. This car, what, to put the size of a Mondeo yeah. with a small capacity engine is pretty impressive. Yeah, and I take it the majority of that power is higher up the rev range. Ah, oh, yeah, it's, it hasn't got much torque lower down. You've got to rev it to get the, uh, get the, get the speed out of the dial. Yeah. 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 Now, we were uh, talking off camera earlier about the connection to uh, Volkswagen Audi with the NSU. That's right, yeah. It was, the NSU got into trouble. Yeah, uh, with the uh, engine issues, the sealing seals in a bit. And VW actually bought them out in 1969 and merged them with Audi. Right. Uh, you could still buy them under you know, special order until 1977, but they were really expensive at that point. Yeah. And that was, that was the end of NSU, really. Yeah. I mean, there was certainly an, an interesting, innovative, forward-thinking car. And um, I know when I was having a look earlier, we, we were looking at those inboard uh, front disc brakes as well, weren't we? Oh, uh, inboard discs. It reduces the unsprung weight at the wheels, you know. It's really, yeah. Really good. And they the look as if they may be difficult to, to work on, but they're not. They're quite easy to get at. Yeah. yeah. It's certainly easily visible, isn't it, under under the bonnet? I don't know about the rear ones, but, uh, I mean, obviously NSU are not the only ones. Jaguar used to do yeah. the same thing, so didn't they? The rear ones are just on, on the wheels themselves. Oh, like, so they're outboard. Uh, I like a top hat shape, the uh, discs, so you've got the uh, drum brakes on the inside for the handbrake. OK. And discs on the outside, yeah. Ah, right, OK. Easy to get to on the, on the back as well, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Not a problem.
There are actually a few Jaguars here today as well. Uh, this one quite notable is the XJC. Uh, this one is fitted with the 5.3 litre V12 as well and fuel injected, which is quite significant for a car from the 1970s. Um, I actually love the blue on this. Uh, anyone who watches Harry's Garage uh, will know he actually has one that was in this colour, uh, but he's had it repainted. Um, this one's got the sunroof as well, which is uh, a nice touch. So we've already had a look at a Jaguar XJC, uh, but I'm here with Garner, who owns this fantastic Daimler Double Six. So now tell me, what? How does the double, uh, the Daimler Double Six, differ from the Jaguar version? There's not a lot of difference. It's slight, in, slight trim differences in the inside. Yeah. But mainly, it's just the sort of fluted grille and the and the fluted rear. Yeah. And are these considered a little more prestigious, a little plusher than the Jaguar variant? The double six Daimler was very rare. Um, they only made about 500 of them. Oh, right. Out of the 10,000 coupes altogether. Right. Uh, and a lot of them went to America, of course. <laughs> yeah. Would they have been more expensive to buy then than the Jaguar? I think they were, I think they were about um, 10 or 20 percent dearer, which is the reason they didn't sell many of them. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, now, obviously, we've been having a bit of a chat off camera, and uh, obviously, it sounds like you do like to use your car, and you, you're taking this on a bit of a road trip, I understand. Yeah, we're going to Classic Clamart in um, a couple of weeks' time, and we still have all the full camping gear in it, and so on and so on. <clears throat> but the, the engine has not been without its problems. Mm. Um, they're very, very complicated. When they're going, they're, they're beautiful. When they're not going, they can be out of pain. Yeah. But uh, this has now had. Um, uh, latest Opus ignition fitted on it. It's had low, low to, uh, uh, Bosch pumps on it, and it uh, and it runs absolutely sweet as a nut now. I know, obviously, for the time, I mean, that mechanical fuel injection system. I think, other than Mercedes, most mainstream manufacturers weren't doing fuel injection until the 1990s or right. 80s at the earliest. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's lovely. It really is a, a nice piece of kit. Well, I wish you all the best with your road trip, and uh, obviously that V12, I'm sure, will, will lap up the miles. Lap up the petrol. <laughs> and the petrol, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's the downside. But we've got to enjoy them while we can, haven't we? Absolutely. Yeah. It's not an everyday car. No, no, definitely not. Well, thank you very much. It's been pleasure. a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Now, obviously, shows like this bring out some real premium classic cars, um, like this lovely Aston Martin DB6 Superleggera behind me. Uh, I had a little bit of a chat with the owner. This car originally um, was registered in Hong Kong um, and was blue, I'm told, originally. Um, came back to the UK. It's uh, been repainted in this red, and I think it really, really suits that colour very well indeed. Now, the owner has kindly allowed me to have a sit in his... Uh, DB6 and uh, oh yeah what a wonderful place to be this is uh, as you can imagine lots of cream leather in here uh, it's beautiful dashboard with a really nice complement of instruments here as well um, I love this thin rimmed wooden steering wheel as well uh, with the DB in the middle of the uh, steering boss there really beautiful all the switch gear is so um, it's all quite quite delicate looking but really really looks nice clock in the middle of the dash chrome around here with the heater controls, um, radio beneath. Um, that radio actually looks similar to another car I've looked in today. Speaker down here in the middle, obviously there's thick carpets uh, in the middle of here. Really dainty little gear lever um, in the centre of there as well. Um, obviously quite a view as you look out of the bonnet as well over those um, those front fenders. Uh, yeah, just everything's finished really, really nicely. Even um, the switch gear and the bezel around this lamp up here and the mirror all done in chrome. Um, and actually quite spacious as well, um, despite this transmission tunnel, I've got loads of room in here for my feet. It's a really nice driving position as well, sort of feet out in front. Um, we've got a little switch down here um, marked as air, again with all chrome surrounding that. Presume that may be um, footwell ventilation. There's one in the passenger side as well, so that's um, quite nice to uh, to see. Now, I'm a bit sketchy on the older Mercedes, but we appear to have a 190 here. I've been having a chat with the owner about this car earlier on. Uh, next to that, we've got a 280 SL Pagoda. Um, it's a really, really nice looking car. Uh, owner tells me that one's done about 100,000 miles, and it's uh, probably just about running at that.
So I'm back in more familiar territory now with uh, some cars from my era and uh, some of them the type of thing that I would have seen a lot growing up. So we've got a uh, Mark II Cavalier behind me there. Next to that, the um, Vauxhall Calibra. Now the Calibra, when they came out in the 90s, actually looked quite exciting, a really sleek looking car. And what we have here is uh, one from towards the end of production. Uh, this is number four of 51 um, limited edition 4x4 turbos. Um, We've, uh, they're also sat 25mm lower, uh, BBS alloys on there, very nicely specced out interior as well with the um, leather and a few other niceties in there. Really, really rare car, um, apparently developed off the back of the uh, success they had in uh, DTM touring cars. Now we have a Mark II Cavalier here, but this is no ordinary Mark II Cavalier because this is a Cavalier calibre, one of 500 made, uh, loosely based around an SRI, but as you can see we've got the Earnshaw uh, style body kit on here. Uh, I'm told actually um, d partly developed by uh, Aston Martin Tickford as well. A um, few niceties in there, things like a trip computer, uh, a revised interior as well, but incredibly rare car. I was hoping that I might have caught the owner of this car, but it's not returned yet. But uh, what we have here is a Lotus Carlton. Uh, but you probably already knew that if you like your cars. Um, a lot of controversy around these cars because back in the day, the police force had just taken um, delivery of a quite a sizable order for uh, Vauxhall Senators, um, which were quite a capable car. 140 mile per hour saloon car in the 90s would, would have been quite formidable until these came along. Um, so... Basically, you already had the uh, GSI versions of these, which was um, already quite a fast car. Um, but then we've got the Lotus Carlton. Um, now, depending who you ask, you'll get a different answer, but... Uh 170, 180 mile per hour, somewhere in that region is uh, what these cars were said to be able to do. Some people say they can actually go faster, um, but like I said, back in the 80s and 90s, there was nothing um, that could touch these in terms of uh, four-door saloon cars. Nothing could even come close. Now, it's such a big show, it's impossible for me to feature every car, um, but just a few more notable behind me. Again, it uh, sort of looks like a picture of my youth. Nova GSI, Ford Fiesta, heavily modified Renault Turbo that looks, uh, well, I remember things like that being on the cover of Max Power regularly in the uh, 1990s. Now, there's a lot of owners clubs out here today as well. So, as I say, the cars, we've got sections by era. Uh, and then we've got some owners club behind me here. Uh, we seem to have a nice selection of MR2s, um, starting with Mark 1s, uh, some Mark 2s and some Mark 3 examples as well. Uh, convertibles, hard tops and T-bars, so a real nice mix there. Another owners club here, we've got the uh, BMW owners, um, and starting off the road we've got a couple of lovely Z3s here. Hard to believe now that these are uh, over 20 odd years old. Um, people of my generation, you'll probably remember uh, this car featuring uh, in the first Pierce Brosnan uh, Bond film, Goldeneye, uh, a nice blue one that he had. Um, now I did recently actually drive a Mercedes SLK, um, which was sort of pitted a little bit against these um, cars, so you may wish to check that video out. Um, I might leave a link to that at the end actually. Um, but yeah, if anyone's got one of these and you fancy letting me have a go, do get in touch because it would be really interesting to compare the two cars and see how they fare. Seem to have a huge selection of Porsches as well behind me, everything from Boxsters to cars like this lovely 930 Carrera behind me. Now there must be almost every conceivable uh, variant of 911 out here today, with lovely Carrera 2 uh, with Targa top, um, further down there. Um, so that looks like it might be a 2.7 RS in the background. Um, these are sort of 3D here, so I'm wading through the middle of the cars now. Now, I love a Porsche 930. They uh, really are my era. Um, I also remember a nice white one in uh, a Billy Ocean video as well. Um, yeah, 930 Turbo in white. Uh, can't get much more H's than that. Uh, the Fuchsia alloys as well, also in white on this car. Looks really, really good. Behind that, another 930, but this time a Targa in red. Um, I think between those two, they've probably made up the posters on a lot of um, people's bedroom walls back in the 80s. So slightly earlier, 911 here, and this one is actually a replica of a race car um, for a series known as IROC. It was a one-make race series. I'm told there were 24 cars. So this one is a, a very nice, a detailed replica of one of those cars. Obviously, we've got the ducktail on the back, a bit like the old 2.7 RS. This particular car runs a 3-litre, which is, I'm told is what the race cars ran as well.
Now, something you just don't often see, even at classic car shows, is this Jaguar behind me. Uh, but the ones you normally see are E-Types and Mark IIs, and XJs. This is a Mark 10. Now, the Mark 10 um, was, I believe, the widest car uh, that you could buy at the time, and I don't think that was um, that record fell until the XJ220 came many, many years later on. Um, but, uh, yeah, these were uh, really a car for people who had a bit of clout behind them. Um, like celebrity owner The Craze, um, I believe, actually had a Mark 10 Jaguar. I've just had a lovely long chat with the uh, gentleman who owns this uh, car behind me. A very rare Hillman Super Minx. Uh, this is obviously an estate car, but it's a 1967. Now, the owner tells me production actually ceased in 66, ready for the new model to come along. But there was a, a request put in for an export order for 10 cars but they had to have diesel engines in and this is one of those cars so they found some body shells unused at the factory uh, and fitted this uh, car with a Perkins diesel engine incredibly rare indeed in fact I think it may well be the only roots car actually at the show today so really nice to see that here so we're going to make this one quick because uh, they're about to call this generation of car into the arena uh, but Chris here has got this lovely uh, Mark 1 Escort and it's a 1300E 1300E yeah it's a yeah. beautiful car, yeah. Well, it won't when we bought it. It was a, a real sack of rubbish, yeah. to be honest. Like, it was a rust box. Yeah. And it's what you see today. It's uh, been cut from front to back. Yeah. No panels, welding done, uh, paint job, interior, etc. Yeah. Engine. It looks fantastic in the really 70s in this purple with the vinyl roof. It's uh, couldn't be from any other era, could it? No, no, no. <laughs> Back in the day when I was allowed, they used to call them the purple people eater yeah. or the purple warrior. But uh, 1972, uh, £1,199 on the road. Yeah, They're worth a lot more than that now. Worth a lot more than that now. <laughs> as well over £20,000 in car yeah. as it is now when the insurance value is a lot more than that. Yeah. But they're just not out there to be basically to be had. You can't put the price on the pleasure they bring though can you? No you can't. It puts a smile on your face and when you see other people stop in the street and look and go wow you just think that's yeah you've got it right yeah you've done it right like yeah, yeah. so obviously yours is a 1300e there's another escort behind us belongs to um, a friend of yours. That's Dean's my friends yeah that's a, a Mark 1 uh, twin cam uh, which is built over nine years. This took five years did mine he's took nine years because he was working I was retired like so I've done a bit Better than him, right? Like. Yeah. Well, that yeah. is a nice car, that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Right, well, Smashing, thank you very much. No problem, any time. So, any regular viewers will know I'm, uh, I don't consider myself a Ford man, but obviously growing up in the 80s uh, in the north of England, Fords were everywhere. Um, and one model I have always liked is the Sierra. Um, again, they were a bit controversial at launch with this jelly mould shape. Um, obviously underneath, a little bit more traditional uh, with most, most cars being front engine rear drive. Now, the one that everyone always seems to uh, hark back to is the Cosworth models. Uh, but personally, I quite like these behind me. What we've got is a 39-year-old um, XR4. Now, uh, this car is near enough daily driven. It lives outside, so um, it's certainly no garage queen. Um, but I think it looks fantastic in this colour, and I really do like the styling of these. I've always liked this, um, this sort of split rear glazing and the cladding that goes around the side as well. Obviously, the Cosworths um, had the same body style as the early three-door cars which just had a, a large um, single side glass on here now the owner's kindly given me permission to have a look inside this car today and uh, yeah real time warp in here the um, I've always liked the interior of these are this you've got this sort of driver favoured centre dash how it sort of curves angles towards the driver um, obviously being that we are in an XR4 obviously um, we do get a few niceties that you might have not seen in the lesser models so we've got um, a rev counter for example in there we've also got things like a clock and uh, is it appears we might have some sort of trip computer in there as well what appears to be a period correct radio cassette as well which is nice to see and i love that we've got um, below that these uh, cassette storage because well again regular viewers will know uh, i do quite like cassette tapes i still use them myself but uh, yeah really nice uh, nice cabin in here um obviously doors are quite thin and light but again it's just a uh, some th the cars of that era that's that's what cars were like uh, we've also got a manual um sliding sunroof as well which is nice to see in here um very blue on the inside of this car but because it's 1980s and it's sporty we've got all this red piping on the doors and around this instrument binnacle as well which is really really nice
a lovely Ford Orion gear hiding there behind me, but uh, it's somewhat dwarfed next to this vehicle. What we have here is a 1986 registered Amphi Ranger. Um, I honestly don't know a lot about these, so I can't really tell you any more, but uh, it's certainly something I've not seen at one of these shows before. Quite a peculiar looking vehicle is this Nissan S-Cargo. Now Nissan, uh, back in the day, made quite a few uh, strange looking cars, predominantly for the Japanese market, um, quite often based on things like the K10 Micra, um, such as the Figaro uh, was another vehicle. But yeah, very sort of retro style, but this is a, a commercial van. Um, automatic transmission in these as well I'm not sure if they actually had a manual available but uh, yeah I've never seen one in the metal uh, but there is a review of one of these on the uh, iDriver Classic channel so uh, if you want to know more about these cars uh, you might want to check that one out well and truly in my area, the 1980s, as we can see, a couple of Escort Cabriolets back there, uh, Mark II Golf CL, uh, another car behind here that I, actually I saw coming in this morning when I arrived, um, Volkswagen Jetta CL, uh, but a two-door, um, I didn't even know there was a two-door um, version of that car, so really nice to see that one. And it's not just... Um, small Volkswagens that are here in German cars today but there's Camper behind us and then we've got an Audi Sport Quattro as well uh, this one uh, one without the uh, blistered wheel arches uh, really interesting livery as well registered uh, on a D so that'd be sort of 86, 87 um, but yeah really impressive um, more German cars as well on the uh, further down the road so how about this one lovely white E30 BMW uh, 3 Series convertible uh, Mercedes SL one of two that's here today this one is a 350 so that's the, uh, the V8 engine version uh, and a really uh, period interior as well in that car um, one I've, uh, the other one I've seen had a black interior but this one is sort of a, um, an avocado sort of colour um, never seen that interior on one of those cars before so I don't cover much in terms of the rest of modern stuff, but occasionally we do get them on the channel. Uh, and I couldn't uh, pass by this uh, 320S Mercedes, uh, as you can see, sat very low to the floor. Um, love the yellow headlamps on there as well. Uh, and we've got some stickers in there, it looks like this car is a show winner. And uh, I can fully see why. It uh, really does look a nice example. A couple of nice capris here as well. We've got this Mark III laser behind me and uh, the camera probably isn't doing justice to how shiny this car is. Um, engines detailed at everything. It is absolutely immaculate. Um, some nice Recaros trimmed out in red and grey as well. Um, really, really uh, nicely done. Behind that, another Mark III as well, a 3 litre. But again, we can't quite get around every car and I do need to move on because we've still got the 90s to do. And sadly, a few cars have already left from there. Now the cars in this section are sadly getting a bit thin on the ground now, uh, which is a real shame, but um, we've still got this Mark III Astra uh, GSI. I, I do remember these cars coming out quite well. Uh, obviously this one in white, I, I remember them in white and red mostly. Um, but yeah, they really did look, look the part when they come out. I always liked how they retained um, a bit of styling from the Mark II with this sort of cut-off uh, rear wheel arch that sort of flares out a little bit. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that's quite nice, but uh, yeah, Mark III Astra again it was such a common car um, and you just do not see them anymore I saw a couple at a show the other week um, a saloon and a, a facelifted five door but um, yeah really not a common car anymore now, quite a treat here to have two rare cars that uh, sort of fall on from each other so up there we've got Ford Cougar um, and next to me here the Ford Probe which was sort of the long awaited successor to the Ford Capri um, obviously pop up headlights which uh, not many cars beyond this point had pop up lights so that's always nice to see and this particular version is the uh, V6 version as well um, obviously you've got these 5 spoke alloys the 16 valves usually had a, a 3 spoke design um, the Probe weren't all that successful in the UK I don't think they had a particularly long run so uh, and again you don't necessarily see that many of them at shows but it's great to see this one here today so I mentioned earlier when we were talking about that little um, Nissan van uh, another car that I mentioned was a Nissan Figaro which is one of these behind me uh, so based on the Nissan uh, K10 Micra um, but with a, they had a, an automatic transmission um, were sort of a Japanese market car but uh, yeah they seem to have found a bit of a cult following these days here in the UK just to the side of me here we've got this lovely uh, Toyota Celica GT uh, and behind me what would have been sort of 2000s but it seems to be a mix of uh, 90s 2000s and everything else now um, but uh, yeah like I say a lot a lot of gaps appearing sadly um, the sun's gone and it's got a bit bit cooler and cloudier here and uh, a, a few people have left which is a bit of a shame really 
Now behind me we've got a very special car. Um, and yes, you would be correct, it is not a real GT40 because they are incredibly rare and incredibly expensive. But what this is, is probably one of the best replicas you're ever going to find. Now, the owner of this car was actually involved in uh, motorsport with the GT40s back in the day. So he really knows these cars well. And what we've got is... Uh, a car that has actually been campaigned in hill climbs as well. Uh, suspension is all rose jointed as well on this car, so it, it uh, as uh, Mr. Ford would have said, this is not a car um, built for you to go to the shops in. It is a replica of the car that was built to uh, beat Ferrari at Le Mans, which it did successfully. Um, now the owners gave me permission to have a good look around in this car I sit inside as well so um, so let's crack on and do that right so I am in um, I only wanted a quick driver change in these at Le Mans is beyond me because as uh, as you can see I just made very hard work of that um, obviously the door does cut away so you've got a little bit of space here but uh, yeah really not an easy car to get in and out of very very low to the ground obviously GT40 40 inches from ground to roof um, yeah, sort of sat very sloped back in here, uh, legs out in front, which I do like. Um, I would say slightly offset, but no, not really, because you are sat quite a long way into the middle of the car. Obviously, you've got this huge wide sill here. Um, gear lever mounted to the right-hand side of you. Um, if you have a passenger, you've got to be very friendly with them, because you, you really are sort of touching them. You're right in the centre of the car here. Um, handbrake in the middle. It's pretty conventional dashboard so your speedometer all the way over to the left there reading all the way around to 200 miles per hour a rev counter reading to 8000 rpm toggle switches here with your um, uh, labels stuck on to tell you what all those switches do but uh, yeah wow real uh, real experience in here obviously you can't see a great deal out of the back uh, you've got these very sort of small windows a very small windscreen uh, with these little mirrors just sort of um, bullet mirrors tucked to either side of you um, obviously you can see the wheel arches but you can't really well you can see a little bit of the uh, bonnet between there uh, they've actually got huge door pockets as well because the doors are quite deep in this car so you've actually got quite a lot of uh, door pocket space obviously you don't have a glove box or anything like that because well you wouldn't it's a race car um, yeah, um, or racing harnesses as well, uh, and a nice small steering wheel, which it needs to be small because you've got to squeeze your legs out from under here. Which brings me on to my next problem, I've got to get back out of this car. Uh, now I'm told I can't um, pull myself up on this part here because you can pop the windscreen out doing that. Um, so uh, yeah, this could be eventful. Um, I'll join you again probably in a few minutes if I can get out of here. So. Right, push yourself out. <laughs> there you go, onto the seat. So the reverse of, uh, the yeah. yeah. Just push yourself out from there. There you go, easy. I'm like a bit more dignified than journeying. It's been a great day here at uh, Castle Howard, uh, which is about to draw to a close, but uh, fear not, because we'll have more classic car content coming soon. Uh, I've got Walton Classic Car Show coming up soon, uh, and also Festival of the Unexceptional, which I actually missed last year, so I'm really looking forward to that one. Uh, so who knows, I may even bump into some of you there. Um, so make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of those future videos. If you've enjoyed the video, give me a thumbs up, and uh, hopefully I will catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.